but there you are. So, okay, hello, and we have uh, our next um, Ask the Kanban Trainer session, um, joint event uh, with ProKanban.org community, and then also with the Lean Agile London uh, meetup group. Um, so we've got the privilege today of having um, a specialist Nisha. Um, say hello, Nisha. Um, Pratik there. I mean, that's the only reason why we tend to invite Pratik to these things. Um, other than he knows a bit about Kanban and flow and metrics and all the stuff, but it's niche, isn't it? Done. Um, so we've got um, Pratik uh, Singh with us. Um, we've got Dan Daniel Vacanti. Both of them are um, absolutely pivotal in the in the um, establishment in launching the the uh, Pro Kanban um, community group. So thank you guys. It's uh, what time is it for you in in the US? Is it about like twelve o'clock? Yeah, yeah, just turned in. Yeah. Okay. So a bit of lunch time for you. No whiskey. It's too early for that. Um, I know you guys are fond of whiskey. Um, for um, some of us, which are more in the in Europe, it's going to be like five, six, seven o'clock in the in the evening. So um, there you are. Good time zones. Um, as usual, we're going to be taking basically uh, open open questions. So we're going to be taking questions from from you um, as we go along. But while we wait for questions to to start, it would be good to have a little bit of like a, maybe a chat about um, company in general. I mean, for example, like um, Dan and I were just talking that we we met about ten years ago. Um, the fact that we are still friends is a, something um, unique. I don't know how, um, but um, we're very good friends. But ten years. It was like, what has happened in the last 10 years or what hasn't happened in the last 10 years um, in the world of Kanban, Agile and things like that? Oh, it's a little bit of like, where are we today after all these years? Yeah, well, I, I, so I, I was just I was doing a training earlier this week. And um, I mean, it's it's I, I, I'm lamenting to anybody who will listen to me um, that it's it's 2022 and we're still talking about story points. I mean, it's uh, I. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of speechless about that. I, so in terms of what has not happened, you know, this, this idea that we, so, some people on this planet still think story points are a thing, you know, and that it's, and it just drives, drives me nuts. It's, but, the I, whole 10 years is, is, is summarized into why are we still doing story points? <laughs> I mean, in, in 2010, I would have made a bet with anybody that, you know, that, you know, sooner or later people would figure out how stupid this thing is mm -hmm. and that we would just stop talking about them. And they seem to have grown in popularity rather than, rather than shrunk in popularity. So I, by the way, if anyone wants to make easy money, ask Dan what he thinks is stupid and then bet that it won't exist 10 years from now and you'll make money. <laughs> yep. That's why I write books about forecasting and predictability. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, well, so given the fact that most places or many places that we, we come into contact with, like training, coaching, and so on, story points, um, good point, good, 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 good topic there. The story points are present. How do you, how do you guys, how do you guys convince people that maybe there is an alternative? A better alternative. I don't know. I like, I like I like to get physical right away. Maybe you know, punch <laughs> him in the face or something like that. That's I don't know. Pratik's got a better better approach than I do. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tend to be more gentle in my approach. Um, I, I think I, I usually start with let's just not even talk about story points. Let's let's that's not even an area of concern for me right now. Let's let's just look at your data. Let's just look at. Let's just look at your cycle time scatter plot and kind of see what's happening and then dig into let's that how do we remove these issues that we're seeing these things are taking 40 days, how do we take care of that. And as a as a consequence of it after you do that for a week or two, I think the team starts realizing that there is no correlation between story points and how long things are taking that doesn't mean the team will stop but as you talk more and more about right sizing and all that fun stuff, the team kind of starts to do the more important bits, which is talking about analysis, talking about right sizing. At that point, if they're spending a couple of minutes doing story points, fine. But most teams abandon it by that point. I, I, kind of like I'm very interested in saying like one or two weeks. That that feels quick. Yeah, I, I tend to think developers are pretty smart when they see data. 
Yeah. yeah. I think, I think when, when you show developers data and they realize pretty quickly that, hey, we're, yeah. this has zero correlation. This, the, these three hours we're spending throwing numbers out have zero correlation with how long things take. Yeah, no, but, uh, no, that's good because I mean I'm seeing that the the, the correlation is you can you can show it very quickly, but sometimes the the, the inertia takes longer to uh, the thing to go. Um, so interesting because you may, we're making many times. I mean, when we're talking about Kanban and metrics and things like that, now we're talking about like um, story points, time, that correlation. Yeah, is there is correlation? No, but sometimes like organizations don't don't even we're not even aware that there should be a correlation between those things. If you're going to use the story points, if it don't translate to time, then why are you doing them? Um, which is why we're not doing it. Are you, is, that, is that part of a conversation that you guys have? Dan doesn't. Dan is just punching people by now. But, but... <laughs> well, I mean, I, and I think it's a fair point that sometimes people make of, hey, these are supposed to be about complexity, not about time. I mean, like that's how it's taught, but at the same point, it's uh, sure, but what does measuring complexity buy us? Mm -hmm. when, when you start going down that path, you go, really, what we are eventually talking about is, is this thing too big? And are we going to be able to predict when things will be done? Those are essentially the two things we're going after. And turns out measuring complexity does not answer that question. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move from story points because otherwise Dan is just going to be there arm crossed, not doing anything. Now I'm going to do something that is going to make Dan talk for a little while. Okay. So I think mentioned story, um, st um, cycle time, scatter plot. Dan, tell us more something about CFDs because I mean we talk about story points in the in the in the Scrum Agile world and all stuff. Kanban and metrics, CFDs. Tell us something about that. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm going to preface this. I'm going to preface this answer with CFDs are probably among my, my, my favorite chart, you know, mm -hmm. out there. Um, but I really do believe it's one of the use, least useful charts for practical purposes, for everyday practical purposes. And forever, for whatever reason, it's, it's gained this momentum within the Kanban community that if you're doing flow, you look at a CFD. Uh, I, I'd love to know where that came from because it's it's just it's just simply not true. Uh, because if, if you do all the things that that Pratik and I and Jose talk about in terms of driving predictability in, into your process, things like you know paying attention to aging, limiting work in progress, your CFD becomes boring. You know the thing is, before you're doing those things, your CFD is not useful. After you're doing those things, your CFD is not useful. So that's <laughs> you know, um, and the, it, CF, CFDs I found CFDs are really only useful for um, if you really want to geek out on this stuff and really learn what's what's going on you know underneath the covers in terms of flow and flow principles. Ninety nine percent of the people walking around out there don't need to know this stuff. I mean, do you, do, you, do you really need to know that you know that horizontal distance on a cumulative flow diagram is an approximation of an average? Uh, rather than an average or rather than a, an exact cycle time. Do you really need to know that? Uh, because you probably shouldn't be looking at those things anyway, right? There are other, there's other better, better data that you should, should be looking at. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm, um, but like I said, if you really, really, really under, want to understand flow, I mean, if that's, if that is your goal in life, um, then, then, then CFDs are a wonderful, a wonderful yeah. tool. But interestingly, we talk about 10 years, because of all that we know each other. 10 years ago, I think when we were like looking at Kanban back then, I, I think FCFDs were quite popular, histograms were quite popular. These days, we did, I didn't know anything about aging. Hmm. And for example, the aging chart is like absolutely game changer. Is I would say like the secret, the secret uh, chart that no one has heard of, and it looks like you're you're doing magic. How did how did the aging chart come to you? I mean, how did you guys start using it or, or, or found it and all this stuff? It actually it actually came out of a, a conversation, and and, and, and there, there's a voice in the common community that we don't hear from much anymore. And I don't know if everybody heard of the name Frank Vega. Oh yeah, um, but but Frank, a tr tr tremendous tremendous thinker in terms of um, in terms of Kanban and in, in terms of flow. Uh, and right about the time I met you, Jose, is, is when I met Frank um, as well. 
And Frank and I would have conversations all the time about Little's Law and all this stuff. And, and we would do these deep dives into like, what makes this thing work? Um, and aging really came out from that discussion, because as everybody probably knows, one one of the big assumptions of Little's Law is that, you know, your aging should, should neither be increasing, on average, should neither be increasing nor decreasing over time. Um, and it occurred to us, you know, this, this is such a big part of Little's Law, and everybody talks about Little's Law, but nobody talks about aging. But aging is the thing that makes Little's Law work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, re- it was really from a, from a conversation from Frank. So if, if, uh, if, if, if none of you know Frank or have ever heard the name Frank Vega, I, you know, I would highly, highly recommend you know, looking up his mm-hmm. stuff, seeking him out. If you ever get a chance to meet him at a conference, go up and shake his hand because uh, just uh, just a great, great thinker on this stuff. Yeah, that was a good guy. What about um, Pratik? What was your yeah your you, aging story and things like that? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Frank and Dan have definitely brought that into as a chart into into to my life. But even before that, I remember when we used to all go to the office and had a physical Kanban board. We mm-hmm. would take the cards every day. We'd say, "Hey, this is this many days," and I think that that would become more and more um, evident that we're something is aging as more and more ticks showed up on that uh, that card. So yeah, that I think it's always the concept of aging. And as as Dan says, what, what when was little slow? The the paper was what 62, 63, Dan. It, it's been around at least since then the concept of of, of aging and mm-hmm. we've used it in one way or the other i'm glad that now we have a chart that actually does that for us okay um one final question and then we're going to go on and take the i starting to see a couple of questions in the chat but um one question that is if okay we, t- we talk about like you you might go and start working with a company where they might or may not be doing kanban they might be doing other flavors of agile and so on What's the one thing that you will be saying? Okay, this is the first thing that I will do. Is it is it the aging? Is it none of that? Is it workflow definitions? Is it what, what, what's the first thing that you try to to help teams um, look into when when we're looking at Kanban? Yeah, well, I mean, so I mean, practically speaking, the very first thing they need to do is is, is define their workflow because a- a- aging makes no sense independent of some definition of workflow. So um, so from a very, very practical speaking, have some sh- shared understanding of, of what that workflow is. Specifically, what does it mean for something to have started? What does it mean for something to have finished? Mm-hmm. Once you've got that, then absolutely by far and away aging. I mean, if, there, if there's one thing that I that I coach teams to, to do is just, just start looking at aging in, in your standup or your daily scrum. Just do that, just do that one thing. Um, yeah. And let's, let's see, see where the conversations take us once, once, we, once we do that. Mm-hmm. Pratik, yeah. what were you no, saying? I'm say, the, 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 this might be a little sacrilegious in Kanban circles, but aging is a lot more important than WIP is. Mm-hmm. If, if you're managing aging, you will by default end up managing WIP. Like it, it'll just it'll just happen. If you're woman, you so that's why I'm glad that Dan said that start mm-hmm. with that workflow and then start monitoring age. You will by default be, yeah. be managing WIP. I don't know if I was the, it's, it's always the, the, the right metaphor, right? So like aging is kind of like the Trojan's horse for whip management. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's, the, it's the gateway drug, actually, is what, yeah. is what it is. Yeah. You, you, first, you, first one's on me, guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we, end up, we end up having this conversation about whip and with limits and managing whip, and it's almost like clashing against walls all the time. And it's like, don't talk about those things. Yeah, um, do aging, and the natural conclusion of aging is whip control. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. Um, we have a question there from uh, who was this? Um, I can only see. I think it's Ilya. Um, I just finished reading. Uh, I think your uh, Action of Agile book done this week. Um, this thing about like um, how many data points or how many how many data sets do we need in order to do um, in order to be able to have baseline metrics? I know that people usually is like, really, how many should we have? Yeah. Uh, um, Why? This is, yeah. This uh, this is this is an easy question to answer and a tough question to answer at, at the same time. 
Um, because it's, it's really all a function of system stability. And I hate to throw out the word stability because stability means different things to, to different people. But if, if you have an unstable process, a, a wildly chaotic, unstable process, and it doesn't matter how much data you got, you will never be, never be predictable. So, but assuming that you have some notion of, um, you know, of, 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 of stability, um, you can generally start doing your forecasting with as little as, you know, that 10 to 11 data points is kind of the, the rough range um, that, that is generally accepted for understanding your system. Uh, there, 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 there are several things that go into this. I mean, generally speaking, more data is better than less data, generally speaking, right? More data is better than less data. But you can, you can, you can start with as little as, as 10 to 11. The more data is better than less data has its own caveat in that usually more recent data is better than less recent data, right? Um, we, you know, we, well, we've got data going back to 2014. Let's use all that data to do our forecasting. Well, no, that's that's, that's probably not reasonable. Um, and then the the kind of the last caveat, I, and that might it might hit one of the other questions that I saw here is. Um, even more recent data might not be great because let's say we're, I think I saw this, this question. Let's say we're going into January. We're trying, we're trying to forecast what, what we're gonna be able to do in January. Well, if we live in the US or we live in, in Europe, um, is it reasonable to use December data to forecast what we're gonna do in January? Well, December was, is very recent. That's very recent data. Should we use our recent data? And obviously the answer to that is, I should say obviously, maybe the answer to that is no. Uh, because of the holiday season. In the US, it's even worse because they're like, okay, we'll go back to, to November. Well, in November, we got the Thanksgiving holiday. So, so now what do we do? Um, and that, that's where it really starts to become more art than science. But assuming you have a stable system, assuming you've chosen a time period, a past time period that we think roughly reflects what we we're gonna do in the future, then you need a lot less data than you, you think that you might. And that, that 10 to 11 numbers is really good enough to get started. I don't know, Patek, do you have anything to add to that? I don't... No, I mean, you spoke for like five minutes, so uh, <laughs> answered everything. And listen to you drone on about story points, so I, and, I, and, just, I just had a counter question, like who let Matt Phillips in? Oh, there, there is no, there is no, there is no queue, so he just, he just entered. Um, oh, wait, I, I'm a host, so I can get rid of people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so, and that's interesting because we're talking about the, the 10 data points and people sometimes say, oh, you, it will take a long time to get the data. Um, how long does it take you to take work 10 work items finish, 11 work items finish? Then you got cycle time data. Um, or throughput, how long does, if you're using days, you know, it's only 10 days, 20 days worth of data and you have throughput data that you can use. Yeah. Assuming that is representative and all the stuff, so that's good. Um, I've got a question here, which is a little bit contextual from Theo Stromklint. Um, would you like to ask the question yourself? Something about him moving from Scrum to Kanban and SLEs. Theo, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Hi there, guys. Uh, hi, Daniel. Hi, Pratik. Real fan, by the way. Um, yeah, well, we're we're in a transition uh, from Scrum to uh, to Kanban in my software. Uh, development team and what we have done today is that we basically just took our uh, current workflow and just applied it to Kanban and um, and really just try to uh, do a retro on it in like three four weeks and then amend it if 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 we need to is that a good way to, to proceed or do you have any other recommendations thank you you go Pratik <laughs> all right uh, there, there is there is absolutely nothing wrong with that approach. Uh, there, just I think the the only thing that I would add to that is there are other approaches to this as well, which which Dan and I prefer. But there's I would also say there's nothing wrong with this approach. Um, one of the ways we do this is we literally have take a blank whiteboard and have the team write down all the things that need to happen to a work item. Um, from beginning to end, whatever that beginning is and whatever that end is for the team. And then talk about mapping that to, okay, what is the ideal mapping of this? How, how do we want to model handoffs of these things? So what you end up with is many a time a system that does not look like your previous system, but might be more in line with how the team actually wants to work. Um, but again, there's nothing wrong with starting with the current system and, and adapting and evolving from there either. Dan? 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I got a question that I think is going to be quite, quite, probably quite popular. Um, it's from Louis. Uh, Louis, uh, was it for you? Sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the surname correctly. Um, do you want to ask the question yourself? I can ask that otherwise. So I can... hey, hi. There you are, Louis. Yeah. So uh, hearing Dan talking about the, the CFD, I was a little bit disappointed, but... <laughs> Oh, uh, and the, the 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 only question that came to my mind is, uh, what is then the best chart to to, to assess the health of uh, your workflow? So that was that was the question that came to my mind, and I really want to to uh, you to yeah, please. And yeah, no, in in in, in real time, um, I'm going to sound like a breaking re broken record, but in real time, I think the, the best chart is the aging chart. Um, and then if we're, we're talking retrospectively, um, then I think the best charts, the scatter plot, the cycle time scatter plot. Um, but I, I, just like see, Pratik said, I have to preface that those are, those are my preferences. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily saying I'm right. I am, um, but I'm not necessarily saying that. Um, but that's the, everything else to me, everything else is just kind of window dressing. Um, but in terms of practical day-to-day -day charts that I use, Aging and scatter plot are by far and away um, the, the stuff that I go to. Yeah, and, thank and, you. Yeah, so one of the reasons we really prefer that is it's it's it, it moves you more towards active management of your work as opposed to you know passive management where you need to let the CFD get into a particular shape before you can get answers from it. So yeah, those those jobs are more active. Mm -hmm. When we talk about like the charts, scatter plot in particular, and um, and connecting it to health or performance of a team, what kind of things are you looking for in looking? I mean, can, can you actually assess the, the health and the performance, or is just asking you questions, uh, allowing you to ask questions, better questions? How would you do that? Yeah, to me, to me, it's about it is about prompting the the, the right conversations. Um, By the way, this is done. Is the one that. I'm, I know Dan says this. You know, Kanban helps you ask better questions earlier on. So yeah, yeah. That, that, and that, that, that's yeah, that, that's that's really what, what it's about. So mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, can 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 we assess if if we're getting better, whatever that means? You know, can we can we assess that whatever change we implemented had an impact on the system? You know, can you know, are, yeah. and and how do we see that? So. Um, do you see if your if your percentiles are getting closer or stable, or what did you see? What there are, I, I know that um, you guys talked many times about, for example, like patterns that you see in in, in scatter plots, like vertical lines, horizontal clusters, you know, or diagonal ones. You want to talk a little bit about those? What, what what are those signals for? Just quickly, or is it too long to talk about them? <laughs> it might be too long. I know, Pratik, do you wanna? Do you want to jump in on that one? We can we can do we can do one or two examples, but again, these are as 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 Jose and Dan have both said, these are potential questions to ask, not the exact answers. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you see on your scatter plot, you know dots that form a form a diagonal line, it probably means things are getting queued somewhere and then one after the other getting done. Probably means that doesn't definitely mean that, but it's something you can kind of investigate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, your scatter plot can provide you things like that. It can also provide you if you see everything's getting done in 10 days or less, but there are these five things that took 50 days. Um, is there some correlation between those five things? Is it, is it that um, our marketing department only gets back to us after, after 50 days? That's why it's getting done there. So it, those kind of horizontal or diagonal or vertical patterns can prompt those questions. Yeah. It's an interesting one it is when you see like the the this the scatter plots having like a like a diagonal at the top. And and that probably what is telling you is that you still have it from the moment that you started this Kanban system and capturing the metrics, you still haven't seen what is the upper range of that system. So yeah, it's, it's another interesting one. Um, what about the, um, um, I've got a question here um, from from Doug, Doug Bolin about um, tools and especially especially one tool. Um, Doug, would you like to ask your, your question? Otherwise it's, 
because tooling is the typical question that will always come with metrics, yeah? Tag, otherwise, uh, I'll go quickly. Okay, um, so like Jira, <laughs> I said it, um, um, being used as a Kanban tool. Um, any thoughts on Jira? I mean, how do you feel about that? Um, you know, how does it compare to other, other, other Kanban tools? Uh, well, first of all, we should say we don't we don't take Arkansas fans seriously on this. Uh, on this it's like we just we don't really want to want to talk about that. But other other than other than that, um, Jira. I mean, uh, a, 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 you know, a tool is a tool. I mean, you know, all tools are good and all tools are bad. You know, I mean, um, it's e it's really really easy to pick on Jira, especially from a Kanban perspective. I mean, that's some low hanging fruit to pick on Jira. Uh, and just how terrible it is because they really haven't updated their visualization as far as I know. They really haven't updated their visualization and, and how they handle Kanban boards and what. We've been talking about what hasn't changed in 10 years. It's been, I think it's been over 10 years since mm -hmm. um, they originally took over Greenhopper, I think. And I don't know that they've changed every, anything since then. Yeah. Um, whatever that was. So uh, uh, the thing is, um, it's it's it, it, it's a bit of a crutch though to say oh we're using Jira and Jira can't do this so you know we we can't do Kanban or or whatever or something like that because you know it, a, any reasonable team with a, a modicum of creativity can can get around those things and and do the things that they 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 really need to do uh, to be successful with Kanban so so yes you know Jira is deficient in in a lot of things but that doesn't necessarily mean that you you can't be successful using Jira uh, to do Kanban. Would I like them? Would I like to see them do a lot of things differently? Absolutely. I've got a whole laundry list of, mm -hmm. of things that I'd like to see done differently, but I still think there are ways around. Pratik used, I mean, you, you used Jira for however many years, and um, I mean, it was in conjunction with a visual board for sure, but uh, for, uh, sorry, physical board. Um, but yeah. uh, and, and many times, sorry, I was going to say, many times the, 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 the tool conversation is something that is, is the decision has taken, has been taken already. So it's, it's almost like you know, th yeah. there's too much investment and you're not going to be able to probably change that that quickly. Exactly. So it's always, it's always like trying again, try, it's almost fighting against the windmills. Um, a tool like Jira with all the shortcomings um, used well, well, you know, you can connect it to, to actionable agile, for example, and get really good metrics. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something we have, we have. It's an ongoing battle that maybe is not not as useful. If you could, if you could choose, I mean, uh, without endorsing perhaps the tools, but if you could choose. Is there any? Would you have any any favorite ones? And, and all the tools are imperfect in some ways. Yeah. Pre, pre pre pandemic, my my answer would be very very easy, very straightforward. It'd be a whiteboard. Me too, yeah. and that's changed sure. now. Isn't it? Sure. <laughs> right. um, hmm. Post post pandemic, um, I, I, you know, I mean, if if we are talking about pure play Kanban, I think the only thing that really even comes close as a tool is, is something like Kanbanize. You know, I, I I would think, you know, if, if really what you care about is, you know, is Kanban and visualization and things like that, um, would, would would be something like Kanbanize. That's that's mm -hmm. honestly the only thing that I see that's come close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, fact, the fact that there aren't a lot of great tools means we have to kind of put the onus back on the team to some extent to go, how do we uh, execute this the way we can? And, and you end up buying the right tool or having the right tool, but I still not use it right. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's how you use the tool rather than I've used the tool. So um, Stefano, you have your hands up. Is it um, something to add, please? Uh, sorry, Jose, I mean, I wasn't sure whether I could actually uh, jump in. Uh, yeah. It's really a pleasure to uh, to meet Dan, Dan and, and Pratik because I'm a huge fan of, of their Drunk Agile series. So nice to meet you. Sorry, I don't want to take any more of your time because I know that this is a, a short uh, meetup. So I just wanted to say that uh, one of the questions was regarding tooling. I put it down and um, you already have partially answered it. Uh, I just wanted to, to double check uh, because I really would like to integrate actionable agile uh, tool with, uh, for example, Azure DevOps, which is the current tool that I use within my organization. I just wanted to, to understand what do you think, whether it is uh, easy to integrate. At the moment, I'm using another tool, uh, which is called Flovis, which I like a lot. It's also produced by one of my colleagues. It's a very powerful Power BI based dashboard. But I just was curious about uh, how would you go about integrating actionable agile with other tools. Do you usually integrate it only with the common eyes or do you also do it for Azure DevOps? Uh, 
Thank you. Yeah, no, for, for Actionable Agile specifically, there, there, there is a plugin. Um, there is an Actionable Agile plugin for, for Azure DevOps, and uh, we're, we're, we're constantly improving. In fact, I, I was just speaking to Julia Wester this morning. I don't know if Julia is on the call. She might be able to speak a little bit more intelligently than I can about, uh, about that stuff. But, you know, we're, we're, we're still kind of learning about, you know, how tools like Azure DevOps store their data, the best way to extract that data, the best way to make it, make it available to, to people who are using it. Um, but and, and and we have plans to have you know if if not very if not immediately but but very very soon to, to release updates to, to that plugin. So if you haven't checked out the plugin, um, you know please do and let let Julia and and her team know about you know any shortcomings that you see. So um, that's 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 the one thing about this this stuff is and, and I think this is what 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 Jose was was getting at. Um, if you don't make it easy for people to get their data, then they're not going to use their data. They're just, I mean, that's just, it's just not going to happen, right? And this is kind of the downfall of tools like Jira and Azure DevOps and things like that. It's so hard to get the right data. You, you want a fractional story point, though, you can get that. 3.2 <laughs> story points, I can get that. But, you know, start and end date for items going through my process, you know, they make it so, so hard to get that type of data. Um, uh, and so that's, that's, that's where a lot of our improvement uh, efforts go is how do we make it so much easier to expose your data because it's your data to yourself yeah. it's interesting because i mean one of the most horror stories that i can always face is going to a client and not for example not being able to connect it to a analytics tool anybody try to download the the raw data from jira and make sense of it i i don't know what kind of black magic um, action agile does to actually make sense of that data because i look at it it's like I don't know where to start. <laughs> I don't know where to actually start. So yeah, it's, it's always incredible. Um, another question is slightly, perhaps a slightly different way. Um, uh, Greg, Greg Williams, you're talking about like the, the human side of coaching. So I guess this question is for Pratik, yeah? No? <laughs> it's definitely not me. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm bowing out, yeah. So it's yeah. Greg Williams, yeah. <laughs> So um, the, the, the context is uh, we've got a, a team that's been under a lot of pressure um, to deliver in a startup. Um, there's uh, quite a healthy burn rate. Um, and um, the developers just want to code. Um, so when I tried to introduce things like the work and progress aging chart, um, they said, hold on a minute. No, this is too much. You're giving us too much. This is another thing you're asking us to do. And furthermore, when I've tried to introduce the chart in uh, meetings, um, they felt um, that if they're on a task that's taken too long, that they're personally being criticised, they see their little dot on the work in progress ageing chart. So it's my job to persuade them that it's in their interest, it's going to reduce their context switching, it's going to reduce the cycle time, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, very hard when they're under pressure, and they don't want process, to put it across in a way that they get buy-in. So you can see I've had my fingers burnt quite badly by trying to, trying to introduce things. Um, I understand the theory, but it's how to put it across at a human uh, level. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting for me always because metrics and data are always seen as very anti-human in a way. And, and, and I, what I'm hearing from you at least is uh, the team is very allergic to process being introduced. Yeah. If they have a process, they're actually allergic to process management being introduced, which, which I can get. Um, what I'm also hearing is we are, we are not allowed to focus, but then when we're being told, but when we're seeing a tool that tells us to focus, it seems like because we're not allowed to focus, things are taking too long. And now that tool is telling me you are taking too long. Yeah. If we could somehow connect with them to go, the reason we're talking about this tool is not so that we can say you are taking too long, but instead say person X is not being allowed to focus because we know they're very capable and they can get this done really quickly, but their focus is being divided so many ways. That's why things are taking too long. If we can somehow get that across, that this tool is not to assign blame to an individual. This is to, this is actually to assign blame to the system. This is to say that we are, this is, I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote Deming uh, that a bad system beats a good player any day. 
what we are really trying to do is to figure out where the problems in the system are, not where the problems are with the individuals are, and how can we get the system out of the way for how can we reduce the process in order to get people to to produce the way we we think they can. So, Brilliant, thank you. Hard shift. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Um, I think that's a good answer there. Um, um, and changing a little bit tack, I mean, this is going to be about sizing, so probably this is Dan's question. Um, Andrea Wong, you have a question? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for uh, bringing this uh, to the event, and thank you for the time. Uh, I'd like to a uh, question about the sizing things. Like, uh, usually, uh, some a kind of a uh, user story or task is uh, too big to even it, it, we cannot uh, split it. But in a scrum, it is uh, considered like uh, anti pattern, like, oh, it's too big to fit in the uh, sprint, one sprint, and we yeah, do that and that. Uh, but in Kanban, is it considered uh, anti pattern that we need to, uh, yeah, somehow uh, uh, make less of it? Or is it okay? Kanban, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah, thank, thank, thanks for the question. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, is it okay or not? You know, make, make, makes it sound like it. You know, there, there's a binary binary answer here when when there really isn't. And the, that I, I would argue the the flow side of the house, the flow per, po, flow perspective would be to be would be more to take a probabilistic approach. Um, you know, so instead of saying yes, everything everything must fit within our SLE or everything must fit within our sprint, you know, it's like, what's a reasonable amount of risk that we're willing to carry if we're wrong, you know? And that to me, to me, to me, that's that's the better way of thinking about it. So it's not like, you know, yes, this thing can fit into our sprint, or no, this thing can't. It's that's that's why Pratik and I talk a lot about right sizing. You know, it was something like a, like an SLE. You know, if, if you're calculating your SLE at the at the 85th percentile. What you're essentially saying when you're doing right sizing is, well, are we, you know, are we reasonably certain that this thing will fit within our SLE? Recognizing that we are going to be wrong from time to time, where we we are going to be wrong, and that is okay. I think we need to need to embrace that uncertainty, um, as long as we're managing risk appropriately. So I, I hope I'm answering your question. There, yeah. So I mean, the short answer is no. There's nothing in Kanban that says no. No, you can't bring in something that that's that's too big, um, but. Uh, there, there, there are certain things that, that, that you can do um, if you see that something's too big and, you know, don't necessarily give up just because you think, oh, this thing's too big. I'm not, I'm not going to work on it. Right. Cool. Um, thank you. Someone that, uh, requested the, the transcript. I don't like this because it doesn't understand me. Um, so you're going to watch. <laughs> Who does? I'm crazy. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but um, okay, um, we had a, a question from uh, Urko Urko Masse. You have a question about um, teams that are not fully allocated to to um, people not being fully allocated to the teams. Would you like to ask that question yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, basically, um, I've been I've been talking about Kanban in my company for some time, uh, so it's been it's picking up and now uh, my managers are happy to, to do a pilot project but it's uh you know oh yeah we have people for the project but we don't know what else they're working on we're just going to push them to do the work uh and, and tell them this is priority this is high priority like like everything else they already have and i'm still going to jump at the opportunity but i would like to have some good arguments to tell them that this is not going to lead to a stable system and this is going to mess up our predictions if if or forecasting if we if we do so how would you <laughs> make that point is uh, is my question you know uh, any advice will be welcome that's it thank you i've got a quick thought if i can jump in particular and i'll let you think no well I was going to throw it to you anyway. That, that's the, I don't know if, if everybody notices critiques. That's a, I'm going to stall while I think of a good answer face. Um, uh, the, the, the immediate thing I would do if, if, if you can, if, you know, if, if there's enough time to do it is, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with Twig or not. Um, the, the, the simulation, the common simulation 
that, that we do uh, called yep. Twig. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and in Twig, there's 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 great evidence in there about what happens when you start to, you know, quote unquote expedite things when you start to constantly interrupt teams with with new work that you want to do, and you can you can see the dramatic impact it has, you know, on, on the data uh, when, when the team takes certain actions. Um, that might be that might be one place to start to to kind of kind of get that that message uh, you know across. As a quick thought. I don't know. Others might have better thoughts. Well, uh, I think you have said the. I thought I thought the the high priority term was going to trigger Dan, but it didn't. Uh, if uh, uh, one of the things that I would suggest, and and don't let Dan don't let Dan know that I said this, that Dan has a great talk on how an expedite sunk the Titanic. Yeah, great. Uh, if you look that one up, it it, it makes the point really well. Um, that 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 I think is a, is a great place to go with it. Um, the other thing is, if, if you are measuring cycle time, if you are tracking those metrics and treating the whole system as, as an improving or a learning system, how we can learn from these metrics and get better, I think you'll start to go towards not having high priority or split people type things anyway. If, if you treat it as a data-based experiment every time, how do we make our data look better? Uh, it'll go that way. Cool. There have been a few Thank questions, uh, um, a few questions about um, Scrum and Kanban. Um, sorry, um, Mike, is it something you'd like to contribute to, to the question I was just now? Yeah, just very, very quickly about Twig. Um, so fantastic little program, love to use it on, on new and old teams, uh, but I find that it finishes a little bit too quickly. So I'm wondering if there's any, any way we can extend the time on that, because yes. that would be really useful. Mike, are you listening in on our, our Amazon Echo here in this? Because um, Pratik and I actually had that exact conversation last night. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I'm, we, we, I must I be hacked. hacked. In. I hacked in. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we were talking. We were talking about the, about that exact thing. It, it finishes, you know, a little bit too early to see some of the, some of the the patterns develop. Um, we'd love to see different scenarios. Um, you know that we, that we could use with Twig. Um, so everybody, please just yell at, yell at Pratik because he needs to start doing some development work on that. So, <laughs> and possibly just getting some feedback from people and see how much extra they would want because I think that's a good one. Yeah, I'd love to put the fundraiser, but it will have to be in whiskey, I guess, for that. Yeah, to get very precise. Okay, good. Um, all right. Um, so, good one. Um, I was um, questions we had about Scrum and Scrum, Scrum and Kanban. Um, as, um, how the two can work together. There was a question before about metrics, um, I read before, but I didn't, I didn't break it in about metrics, in how can you use metrics in Kanban, um, in Scrum. But um, Esther, you have a question um, which is very connected to that. Esther Calapos? Hi. There you are, Esther. Hmm. Hi. I hope hmm. the hand is going to be okay. I don't have headphones, so let me know. Uh, but yeah, I've been uh, trialing actionable agile at my uh, company. I've been trying to convince managers that this is um, Yeah, we have a Kanban project, which uh, was the easy one uh, to start using it. But we also have a Scrum project at the moment. And we're just wondering, would you recommend actionable agile to be used with Scrum? And if so, the kind of pitfalls that I should be wary of. Um, just, just, uh, yeah, flow metrics in general. Yes. With scrum, um, yeah, anybody, anybody who, I don't know if you're familiar, but you know, I, I worked with scrum.org to help to develop their curriculum for professional scrum with Kanban. Um, and as, as, as part of that class, you know, we, we talk a lot about the flow metrics. So I think anywhere you have flow, whether it's scrum, whether it's safe, whether it's ordering coffee at Starbucks, right. Anywhere you have flow, I think these, the, these flow metrics can absolutely help. Um, so I mean, I, that's why I would put the emphasis on the flow metrics themselves. The, the, whatever tooling you use, whether it's spreadsheet, whether it's actionable agile, whatever that that's that's a different conversation. But but yes, yes, yes. I I don't know how agile, quote unquote, agile teams can be successful without flow metrics. I mean, I I think they can, um, but it's it's not something I I would probably bet on. And, and if I add something, which is I mean, when when we're doing dance dance. Um, um, Scrum with Kanban class. Um, one of the things that is really interesting many times is that you know, Scrum is Scrum and Kanban are fully compatible. 
Just like I mean, the, the, sometimes what we talk about Scrum or the way we talk about Scrum is 10 year old, 15 year old Scrum. Um, one of the things that I, I actually admire about what happened in the Scrum world is that it has been moving more and more and more and more towards flow. And today I would say that they are pretty much, I mean, fully compatible. I mean, you could say Scrum is a version of Kanban. So, yeah, controversial maybe, but no, it is. I mean, it's, there is nothing nothing incompatible. The only thing that you might have is that Scrum is very focused on teams and that assumes that it has to be a team, but, but nothing in terms of like flow management that is incompatible, so it's great. Um, Cool. Um, Neil, Neil M, you have a question about um, Drunk Agile and conversations about like cycle times and Monte Carlos and stuff like that. Would you like to ask a question, Neil? Neil. If Neil doesn't come, I will say, I will read it out. Uh, so he was talking about like um, in a recent Drunk Agile episode, um, something that's still confusing that he said, you use cycle time for single item forecast and Monte Carlo for multiple item forecast. Um, but then if we have a feature with a low number of stories, the Monte Carlo simulation often comes out less than our cycle time. So wondering you have any suggestions or pointers um, if, if he's doing something wrong or if that's something you connect to. So we do, you, do, you want to do, do you want to do that one, Pratik, or do you want sure, to do I'll it? Sure, Yeah, you do. Um, yeah, it's, uh, th there are, and again, the, 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 the episode that's being referred to there has a lot more detail on this, but um, what Monte Carlo is really saying is, let's say, hey, when will the next three things to get done? It's saying from right now going forward, when will three things get done? It's never saying what those three things are going to be. We have no idea what those three things are going to be. Most likely, and just most likely, not absolutely, there are things that are already in progress, they're already in the system. Um, if if these, this, this feature with three things is still in your backlog or not even been picked up, it's probably not going to be those things. And I think that's where the confusion comes in. All, all cycle, whether it's cycle and scatter plot or Monte Carlo, all they're telling you is what is the probability of the next thing getting done or when the next thing might get done, or when the next set of things will get done. It's not telling you what those things are going to be. That's the gist of it. There's a lot more in that episode and we might spend too much time talking about that. Yeah, I mean, so I am pretty quick. I mean, wouldn't you agree if the Monte Carlo simulation comes out less than the cycle time, then so like say you're doing a Monte Carlo simulation, like you said, on 10, my, my guess would be that you probably have 10 things in progress right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and the Monte Carlo simulation is probably assuming, you know, not that it's really doing this because it's not smart, um, that those next 10 things are the things that you have in progress. Th those are the 10 things that are, are, that are going to get done. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. And this was a, there was another question about this that you you might know that you're choosing ten, but it might which ten, yeah. and, how they, and how they will exit the system, um, no guarantees. Oh, okay. Um, before we go to the next question, we might be the last one. Um, you just mentioned uh, drunk agile here. The question I talk about drunk agile. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit? I mean, drunk agile. If you are not subscribed from watching the drunk the drunk agile. The drunk agile that's good. That's a good moment to, to lose my pronunciation. Drunk Agile. It's a great YouTube. Um, you can see those two. Um, basically, Nisha is the is the is the lead. Yeah. But Pratik and Dan uh, covering topics on on Kanban, on metrics, on general life, met, you know, flow. Um, tell us a little bit about how um, just about um, what's coming up. Any any plans for Drunk Agile? What what is going to happen with it? Why should people watch it? And the answer would be, don't. No, but you should watch it. Should. <laughs> That's why you watch it. It's just niche. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, you, those who do watch it will probably already have guessed this. We yeah. never have any plans. Literally before the episode is like two minutes before that. What do you want to talk about? And we talk about it. So we're probably going to continue doing that. But... <laughs> We, yeah, we, we used to have Pratik's magic whiteboard where we just write down topics on, you know, on the whiteboard and then 
you know, a day later, he would erase everything, you know, um, so. But um, probably, I mean, some, some, some topics that, that may be coming up that probably will be coming up, things like um, deeper dives into, into statistics, uh, statistical process control, um, you know, uh, you know uh, understanding, uh, you know, um, data and variability, variation, you know, that, that, that type of stuff. That, that, that's, that's a big topic that we have not, we barely touched on, um, that I think we have, a, you know, a, a bunch of material that, that we can do. Um, so. Is there a way for people to suggest topics for you? Yeah, I mean, hit, hit us up on Twitter, hit us up on, <laughs> yeah. hit us up on LinkedIn, you know, hit us up on Slack, on the ProCom on Slack. If you're not part of the ProCom on community, please join us on the ProCom on community in Slack and hit us up there. I mean, you, or even anything. Comments in the video. I mean, we're, yeah. we're, we, we, we prefer it when we get asked questions and, you know, our, that our customers, we know that our customers are, that our listeners want to hear. So. <laughs> Um, I'm only ask, asking this because uh, we've been dealing with about like a queue of about 20 something questions and at the moment the queue has gone up to 40 questions. So probably we have to do something. Um, interestingly, um, in a few months time, uh, for those of you that are in London in particular or nearby, Dan and Pratik are going to do, um, you're planning to do like a live Drunk Agile session at the Lean Agile London conference. Is that is that a, a commitment, a promise? Uh, sure, as much as we can, yeah. Yeah. How high is the stage? Because just want to know if I stumble off of it. What the <laughs> we'll, we'll um, but the, 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 hopefully you guys will be there for, for two days. So if you're around in London during that time, um, you, you can, you know, seeing people in 3D, that feels very odd. But yes, that will be good. Um, Six minutes. Final question. I, I, I leave the I leave the most controversial question to the one because I know I know this is going to make Dan really go happy. Dan, there is a question about flow efficiency. Oh. There you go. <laughs> um, Julie, Julie Starling, and, and and I'm saying this because actually, for example, this is is a is a metric that I like. I know Dan doesn't that much, so. Um, yeah. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like I've seen your thoughts on flow efficiency on Drunk Agile, and I, I do completely agree as well. Sorry, Jose. But do you think there is any sort of benefit to this being used to demonstrate improvement to like exact level type people? And also, um, so we, we've gone to a bit of a restructure recently, and they're really keen on us demonstrating sort of the increase in effectiveness so I've, obviously i've got things like throughput and improvements in cycle time but listening to your um, podcast with carl scotland as well i almost think i'm like trying to find this magic metric and i i, I, I yeah any ideas <laughs> sorry a lot in there for six minutes yeah, yeah um but i'm particularly you want to go or are you uh i'll start with the flow efficiency and i'm sure you'll jump in uh yeah it's 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 one of those metrics that is good to kind of be aware in a general sense initially and then kind of forget about it when you're actually doing the work because mm. if you're if you're watching your board day to day you don't need to worry about it if you're if your stuff that's sitting around not being worked on on a daily basis is low low efficiency is just going to take care of itself um, maybe, and again, I, I don't know what people that are looking for the reports are looking for. Maybe you could go, hey, back then it used to be this. Now that we've been watching things day to day, it is now this. It used to be 30%, now it's 80%. But then even that is potentially misleading because it's so hard to calculate. Yeah, and that's that's the thing I'm struggling with is, um, yeah, proving to them that I could, I could get them a number, but actually it's so difficult to um yeah it's probably wrong anyway yeah yeah that, that yeah that that would be my fear is you know you can pull the, show them the flow efficiency number but you know it's, it's it's dubious um you know at best i wish i wish i had the magic metric that i could hand all of you to say yes this is what you look at so you know that you're improving um I, I say this all the time in my trainings. As much as I love all of you, if I had that answer, I would not be talking to you. I'd be sitting on a beach counting all my money, right? Um, but uh, but I, I I don't I don't have that answer, and I'm we're in this kind of continual search for what is it. That's why we love the questions from like you know the Carl Scotlands of the world who who throw that out there and kind of kind of challenge. Well, you know what what is it? I I I really don't know. Um, I, I, I wish it was flow efficiency. I don't think it's flow efficiency. I wish it was cycle time. I don't think it's cycle time. I, I, I just, I, 
I don't know. I'd love to hear other people's, you know, thoughts on on what that could be. Um, but and, and I think is is not flow efficiency as a number, as a metric in particular, as well, which is part of a problem. That it takes so much time to try to calculate that number, and then what? What do you do with that number? Yeah. yeah. Um, we did. I remember having a conversation, uh, two of us, um, where we say like, if it was used as a maybe as an indicator of what might be happening, it could be more more perhaps more useful. But the problem is like people start with like, okay, we are seven percent. Okay, so what? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a, a good a good friend of mine. I, I don't know, I don't know if he's published any of his stuff, but a good friend of mine. His name is Tom Stone. Is, is, has been doing a ton of interesting work around you know things like flow efficiency um, or, or cycle time in general as relates to financial metrics. You know, and can we draw a direct correlation between you know improved flow efficiency and better financial performance? You know, of the company. So. You know, I think I think there's a lot of fertile, fertile ground there for some of the things that you're looking for, Julie. Um, but uh, and as an industry, I don't think we're we're, we're there yet. We're anywhere any close to that. But th those are the types of things I think I would be looking out for, and I think that would resonate with the CEOs of the world. Hmm. Excellent. Um, as a as a maybe just as a party thought, I mean, um, when you look at the world of, I mean, you said like we don't we don't know the the answer, so we don't have the magic. Will there ever be a magic one? Going forward, what, what do you think? What do you think? Kanban metrics? Where are we going? Any any hopes and aspirations? Apart from I think you were touching on that already, Dan. But yeah, any yeah. any hope and aspiration? What, what 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 are the interesting things happening? Yeah, I mean, I I, th I honestly think we've only really scratched the surface. I mean, the the things we talk about, say in the in the Kanban guide, um, you know, there, there there are four. We literally, I think we hopefully we call them the basic, but there are four basic metrics, are just the absolute basics that 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 you need. Um, there's so much more, right? you know. I think I think that that can be be talked about. Um, so I, I really think we've just scratched the surface, and I'm 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 really interested in, like I said before, you know, tying things more to maybe financial performance of you know of, of companies, uh, to more, um, you know, especially now in the, the pandemics, but a lot of focus on work life balance, and you know how you know how how do we prove that our that our yeah. Yeah. people are happy and we're, we're, we're more effective because they're happy, you know, th those types of things. Yeah. We've, we've really only scratched the surface when it comes to flow and, uh, and the health and performance of a process. That's excellent. Pratik, what about you? Well, yeah. And there's, I think even before we get to that in the short term, there is bridging the gap between the terms that we use and financial terms too. It's, it's uh, looking at, at aging and whip as investment instead of, or, or the size of the bet we are making, uh, as opposed to just number of days that something has aged or whatever. It, we, we also need to start changing that language because really what, when you look at a board, we should be seeing how many days of unverified bets are sitting on this board rather than the whip or the age. Mm -hmm. We start moving our language in that direction. I think we'll also start moving overall thoughts in that, in that direction too. And the interesting thing, those, those two things are excellent, and it would be great to see a world when we're using this. On a, that would be the common expectation that you see in businesses and teams using, rather than being kind of like an aspiration that we have. So um, here is for, for all of us in the in the program bank community to help that become a reality. Um, it's 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 o'clock. I'm in Spanish. I don't know about time, but I think today we've been at one about time. Um, so um, thank you everyone for the excellent questions. There have been like far too many questions to cover. Um, hopefully we can follow up through like yeah, Dan said. Um, contact. Would he say like LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever? Contact uh, Pratik um, and and Dan with questions, follow ups. We hope to see you guys. Thank you for your time. I know that you are kind of like sacrificing your lunch time um and we'll we'll see you soon again there is um for uh us a Kanban training sessions there's another one in a few days two weeks two weeks time i think with um john coleman who was one of the co-creators um, with dan uh, for the the Kanban guide so another opportunity to to explore the wonderful world of Kanban. thank you very much have a lovely morning afternoon evening wherever you are in the world um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Right, thanks, everyone. And th thanks, uh, thanks, Jose, for facilitating this and putting it on. Thanks for, for thanks for working on doing that. But thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and especially Nisha. Nisha is still the, the yeah. special one. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Thank
Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate all your contributions. Vaya con Dios. Everybody. <laughs> okay.